and our financial director, and Megan Caldwell. She is our public health, education, and outreach officer. This is a new position at the district, so not, not familiar with it yet. Uh, they're going to be um, talking more than I am tonight because they may know a lot more about the district than I do. Um, however, I want to make a couple of remarks. A lot of things have changed at the Mosquito District in the last couple of years. Uh, primary among those things is that in July of this year, the Board of Trustees decided not to renew the contract of the manager, the general manager. And we are currently about the business of uh, identifying and selecting and hiring a new general manager. That process we anticipate will be finished in January. Um, also at the district, since I've been there, which is just short of two years, um, there have been 10 new trustees appointed. Now, part of that is because of the fallout from the 2013 grand jury report uh, chronicling the problems at the district. We've, uh, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of energy over the last two years, I would say two years, to kind of uh, correct that problem with new policies and that sort of thing. Ms. Endo will talk a little bit about the financial changes. And um, I think by the middle of this coming year, we will be completely different, different attitude, different personnel. Uh, we have a new board president, new board vice president, and in August, they asked me to be the secretary. So it's all new faces, all new blood, and things are going really well. So I'm going to have Rosenda talk with you about uh, some of the rebranding issues and website and things that we're doing. Okay. Again, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Rosenda Rodriguez, and I'm currently the interim district manager and finance director. Um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes um, going over our financial programs. So in the last couple of years, the um, district overhauled it, their financial programs. Um, and part of the evaluation process in doing this overhaul, uh, the first thing that we did was we identified areas that had potential for, for risk. Um, and in identifying those areas, we implemented internal control. Um, those internal controls um, allow us to have adequate oversight, um, the segregation of duties. So, Within finance, uh, there isn't one individual who has control over a process from beginning to end. There is someone who initiates it and then someone who approves that. Um, with internal controls, we implemented and also changed um, some uh, existing financial policies. Some of the areas with, that were identified with potential risk were um, payroll, cash, um, purchasing, and our credit card program. And so by implementing internal controls and policies, we've mitigated some of that risk, and so we're protecting our district now. Um, we also recognize that we have um, cash in our bank. And so in, in analyzing that, the Finance Committee and myself and our district manager looked into setting up reserve policies. So the California Department of Public Health recommends that each mosquito and vector control district have a um, public health emergency fund. Um, so you never know when the county may encounter some sort of um, disease outbreak. 
and so we have created a reserve fund for that. Uh, like other municipal agencies, we created a reserve fund for OPEB, so other post-employment benefits. Um, and the other one is um, we recognize that we have infrastructure. We have buildings, vehicles, and we need to maintain that. So we created a reserve policy for equipment repair and replacement. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been reviewing our budget process and we've identified areas where we, 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 we know that we, we can do better. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing process and when we start this process again in, in March, we'll probably make some more changes. Um, with the budget, we have also established a mid-year review um, program. So in the middle of the year, we decide we're gonna look at what our budget assumptions were at the beginning of the year and at times, priorities change. And so at that time, we determine whether or not we want to reallocate some of our monies from one account to another. Um, the last thing with regards to our financial programs is the district um, created a comprehensive financial reporting packet. We believe in transparency primarily. I mean, that was the reason that we did this. So it allows us, uh, our finance committee, to review our, our financials in depth. We provide this financial packet to our board as part of our board packet on a monthly basis. And we also, in keeping with transparency, um, we put it on our website. So anyone from the public can go on the website and look at our financial packet. With regards to our other programs, um, we had a, a, a request for proposal for uh, legal services. So we have a new legal counsel and uh, that's Burke, Williams, and Sorensen. They're based out of Oakland, and they're doing a fabulous job for us. Um, as Katie mentioned, we were lacking in having a, a really good public outreach program. Um, we're here to serve the residents of the county, and so that is where we decided to hire Megan. Um, so Megan is our public health education outreach officer. <laughs> And um, she's doing a great job. Um, one of the first things, and Megan, Megan just started in September. So one of the first things that we had Megan do was uh, we wanted to, to have a new face for the district. Um, so we went through and did this rebranding initiative. As you can see from the PowerPoint slide, we have uh, new district colors, we have a new logo. We want to differentiate ourselves from, from the image that people, or the perception that people had of us before. And so this is kind of the first step in, in showing a new face of the district. Um, we're also uh, currently working on this, it's not on the slide, but um, this big program called Map Vision. And what that does is it's a, it's a web-based database system where we're able to track everything that the district does. Um, it's all, uh, it's got mapping capabilities that we'll have on our new website. Um, and we're gonna have a lot of that information for the public online. It's gonna help us with uh, fogging updates and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's really, we've got a lot of really exciting things going on. Um, speaking about the website re uh, redesign, we got some feedback from our trustees and the public. Our website is a little outdated. So um, in January, we're gonna roll out a brand new website. It's much more professional. Uh, as you can see from the top, it's got a search feature, so you're not gonna have to go through the entire website to try and find documents. You can search for them. There's uh, an item on there that says, I would like to. There's quick links. There are buttons there so that you can request services, report dead birds, sign up for notifications. Um, and we've integrated social media, or we will be integrating social media with that. So if people want to sign up for our Facebook page or Twitter account, um, all of that is going to be on our website. Uh, lastly, I wanted to mention that uh, your vector control technician, the individual who's, who's working in your area, uh, Jim O'Brien, uh, he's been working in the Half Moon Bay area for a long time. He's been at the district for over 15 years. He's extremely qualified, and so we just wanted to reassure you that the person that you have working in your city is one of our best uh, individuals. And I'm going to hand this over to Megan now. She's gonna talk about our services. Good evening. 
So I am, in fact, not Brian Weber. Uh, Brian is stuck on 92 right now, so I'm going to take over for him. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about the things that we do. So a lot of people think that we do mostly mosquitoes, because mosquitoes is in our name. Um, but we also help out with a lot of other vectors. You can see fleas. We can remove ground nesting yellow jackets. Um, we can help with rat exclusion, cockroaches, raccoons. Um, we have a lot of people who don't know exactly what sort of pest is bugging them, and we can help them figure out what it is and what to do about it. Um, we do some mosquito work as well. One of the things that goes on here in Half Moon Bay is that you guys get a lot of standing water this time of year. And the way that we treat that to avoid you guys getting a ton of mosquitoes is that we use biorational products. Those are specific to mosquito larvae, so they don't hurt the environment or other animals or people or pets, but they do get rid of the mosquito larvae before they become adult mosquitoes that can bite people and transmit disease. It's also tick season right now, uh, so Lyme disease is a concern. And one of the things we're gonna be doing this winter is doing tick surveillance in actually one of your local county parks here. So our laboratory staff will be coming out to collect ticks and test those ticks for Lyme disease. So we can find out if Lyme disease is present in the area and if so, in um, how, what prevalence. I've also heard you guys have some concerns with raccoons. Um, the big concern with raccoons is that their feces can transmit a parasite called raccoon roundworm that can make people really sick. Um, and a lot of the raccoons in San Mateo County do have raccoon roundworm. So we wanna make sure that we get the word out to your residents that if they find a raccoon latrine, which is a place where raccoons repeatedly go and defecate and leave their feces, um, that there are precautions that need to be taken when cleaning that up. So your residents should definitely contact us and we can provide some guidance about how to do that safely without anyone getting sick. Also, if anyone finds they have raccoons living inside their structures, in their house, in their attic, garage, um, we can also provide some advice for getting them out and keeping them out. And the other thing I wanna make sure you guys are aware of is that we've had a really active year for West Nile virus. We're winding down now in the fall, um, but we've had 20 dead birds collected in the county that tested positive for West Nile virus. We've had 15 mosquito samples here in San Mateo County that were found to have West Nile virus. Um, and when you find adult mosquitoes that are infected with West Nile virus, that means there's a chance for the disease to be transmitted to humans. Um, but we're really proud of the fact that we've had zero human cases of West Nile virus here in San Mateo County. If you guys have questions about the things I've talked about or about other things, you can reach us um, you can come by our office. We're at 1351 Rollins Road in Burlingame. You can give us a call. Our main email address is info at smcmad.org, or you can visit our website at smcmad.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. So you can see we're, we're busy over there. Staff is really uh, an excellent staff, and it's been my pleasure to work with all these people. Anyone have questions? Uh, thank you very much. Um, as well as rebranding, it looks like you've really revamped and taken a lot of feedback and concerns that the city has had with this, um, as well as the financial situation that was exposed, and looks like that's being taken care of. If you had one thing that our residents would have to look out for, um, what would that be? Is it the standing water in the small ponds? Is it a certain time of year? That's a difficult one to, to answer just with one thing because um, these vectors are cyclical during the year. Uh, during the summer months, yes, the catch basins, the backyard, uh, one of the things that we didn't mention, um, backyard ponds and, and fountains and that sort of stuff. The county has a program with these fish. What are the fish? Oh, they're called mosquito fish. Uh, they breed them over in, in uh, the district. We have a great big giant new tank that they come in and people can come by and get them for free, put them in their ponds and that takes care of the mosquitoes. Um, that information is on our website, is it not? Yeah. Uh, in the winter months it's ticks and we have a lot of ground ticks out here uh, w with particular over near, um, I guess it's over there, Smithfield in the tall grass that's over there. The ground ticks are everywhere. Um, 
mosquitoes in the summer, raccoons, 24-7, 365 at my house. Um, they're everywhere out here. And uh, you don't have any snakes or anything? So I, I'm sorry to be as that vague, but uh, if- No, I threw you a big question. <laughs> um, does, does council have any questions? No. Well, great. We can um, put this um, a link to this on our website because I think your website has great information and we just learned something about the fish. So that was that yeah. was new to me. So that's great. And they're free. They'll deliver them, I think. Great. Thank you very much for coming here this evening. This Thank was you. great. Thanks. We'll go on now to Mayor's announcements of community activities and community service. Is there anything in particular Council would like to point out that's coming up? in the next weekend besides Santa Claus and other good holiday things around? Okay, no, okay, good. And we did not have a closed session since our last meeting. Pardon me, Mayor uh, Fraser, members of the City Council, I actually do have a closed session report, um, but it's not about tonight's meeting. Um, you may recall, those of you, you who were on the Council, that we had a closed session at the October 21st meeting to discuss an item of pending litigation. That was the Gradstein slash Gorman versus California Coastal Commission case. Um, council did give, uh, act, uh, give direction that approved a settlement agreement in the, in the case at that time. Uh, however, it was not reportable out of closed session because the settlement terms hadn't been finalized. They had now been done so and an agreement had been executed and so that's a matter of public record. So I want that to be announced for the benefit of the public. Um, by way of background information, uh, the gradstein Gorman litigation was filed against the Coastal Commission as the respondent um, in regard to the Stolowski project, which was approved by the City Council in January of 2012. Stolowski project is a four-parcel uh, subdivision located uh, on uh, Cabrillo Highway just south of Washington. So it's west of Highway 1, south of Washington Boulevard. Uh, I guess you call that the Naples uh, subdivision, so just to the south of that. Um, uh, just procedurally, an appeal to the Coastal Commission uh, is generally conducted in two parts. The first part is where the Coastal Commission analyzes and makes a determination about whether or not the appeal raises a substantial issue with regard to the project being appealed uh, consistency with either the policies inherent in the Coastal Act or those that are set forth in the city's certified local coastal program. Uh, and uh, assuming that the Coastal Commission does find a substantial issue with regard to the consistency with the Coastal Act or the LCP, then uh, it proceeds to consider the merits of the appeal. So this project was approved by the City Council at the January 2012 City Council meeting. And at its May 15th, 2014 hearing, the Coastal Commission on a 9-2 vote found that the project raised no substantial issue, um, thereby affirming the City Council's approval of the project. Um, the lawsuit was filed shortly thereafter. As you might imagine, it raised the, the question of the project's consistency with Coastal Act policies and the LCP. Um, however, the parties, namely the Gradstein, uh, Gorman uh, mm -hmm. folks, as well as Stolowski engaged in settlement negotiations very shortly thereafter. And um, Coastal Commission uh, legal counsel from the Attorney General's office and my office, as well as attorneys for both parties were also involved in those negotiations. Under the terms of the settlement, Stolowski has agreed that he will not construct a a proposed 48 inch storm drain cul culvert that would have been used to uh, divert flows from the Pullman ditch, which is located to the north of the project. That would have diverted flows for essentially from Highway 1 to the west uh, side of the Gradstein Gorman residence, where the Pullman ditch actually runs beneath uh, their residence in a culvert at, um, at this time. Um, The construction of the ditch would have required the removal of several mature cypress trees that are along the boundary of the Gradstein property uh, that it shares with the Stolowski property. And as a result, as part of the settlement, 
Stolowski's also agreed that he will not remove those uh, mature cypress trees and will construct the sewer line that will serve the project in a manner so as to minimize uh, any impact on those trees. So that essentially are the substantive terms of the settlement. Um, the parties also agreed that they'll all be responsible for their own respective attorney's fees and costs. And the terms of the settlement are now a matter of public record, so the public, upon request, um, may obtain a copy of the settlement agreement at this time. I'm happy to respond to any questions or comments, um, but otherwise that concludes my report. Thank you, Tony. We'll go now to city council reports, and um, I'll start with my right, Councilmember Penrose, in the two weeks you've been council member. And you didn't report any activities um, or community things you attended? No. Oh. No, just that I'm a little overwhelmed right now, but willing. All right, I totally understand. Councilmember Reddick. I just wanted to report that um, I was in a restaurant having dinner and sitting next to a couple who were from Hamilton, Ontario. And they remarked that they'd been visiting um, Half Moon Bay and the Co side uh, several times over the years. And this was the first trip that they, they actually knew that we had a, a main street in a downtown. And um, I told them I was on the council and they strongly recommended uh, signage on Highway 92 and uh, Highway 1 uh, directing people to the downtown. Now that they know that it's here, they've fallen in love with it. And over the course of a week have eaten at you know, a lot of the different restaurants and shopped at the stores. So I think it's just a good lesson for all of us about uh, making sure that people know that we're here so that we can you know, keep our downtown you know, vital. So um, that's the anecdote I wanted to share. I have made a couple of storm damage related reports to staff, which um, they were very good about responding to uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, I've heard from a variety of different uh, citizens, just you know, well wishing uh, new term on the council. So I was grateful for that. And that's really the only report I have for this meeting. Great, thank you. Council Member Muller. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll get through the simple things quick. I'd like to thank staff. Uh, hopefully everyone has seen this mailer regarding uh, our storm drain system, our treatment plant about not flushing things and also protecting our pipes. It was an excellent uh, mm -hmm. uh, flyer sent out in the mail. Uh, I brought that to a regional board meeting last Wednesday and they were very pleased to see that we are, are being proactive in, in announcing those types of things. Um, and then last Thursday, which we've all been waiting for a great storm day, uh, it showed up and uh, uh, the EOC center was open. I'm sure staff's gonna comment on that, but uh, uh, with uh, staff being there and also uh, Sheriff's Office Lieutenant Muncie was there, Cal Fire was there, our ham operators were there, and it really uh, was a great uh, uh, opportunity for everyone to see what was missing and what needed to be adjusted there for uh, potential disasters. And uh, I too also went out and visited storm drains and it's kind of I ironic that uh, Stolowski has a settlement going, but uh, I went down to Naples Street there and they do get some pretty good flooding and on Pullman Ditch and uh, also uh, uh, Kehoe and uh, uh, all the other ones that cruised through, and then on Metzger Street, we did uh, make a stop there with a homeowner that had some drainage issues, and uh, staff did a great job. And uh, also attended a finance committee meeting with the mayor, uh, and uh, then this afternoon, we, uh, uh, mayor hosted uh, a delegation from uh, China at City Hall, and uh, they were really fascinated by open space. Uh, I think they were really fascinated by that. And they wanted to comment about buying property too, but we didn't go there with them. And, and uh, so uh, it was a, a pretty busy week and we just got another inch of rain this afternoon, this evening. So uh, the water is flowing and the ditches are flowing right now. So let's hope uh, we don't get too much more right now. So thank you. Thank you. Um, just want to comment on Night of Lights and thank um, Main Street merchants and everyone involved for helping to put that on. That was another great evening and to the 
um, local children's choir who sang too. That was um, extra special. Um, but a, a really good night, and it didn't rain, and it was unusually warm for this night of lights. So that was that was great. Um, and also, I know that the city manager is going to report on some of the activities of public works, but I know we saw many of them out um, early, early in the morning to help with the deluge. And the community, with having two or three days warning, I think really helped all of us. Everyone had their bushes and trees trimmed and anything that could move around. That really hurt. It, um, it didn't hurt as much as it has in the past. So that was good. Um, I did go on storm watch, as many people did. And the Magnolia Ditch, um, we had to get an emergency CDP to clean that because that overflowed onto the road and up into people's driveways. There was just, just debris of trees and the eucalyptus that are there. So it was unfortunate that it had to get that bad, but that got cleaned up and as it's subsided a little bit. Um, and just briefly on our guests today that came from China, they were from the government of China, the agricultural division. And so it was very interesting to hear the difference um, the difference of freedoms, I think, is the biggest takeaway that I had here when we were explaining, especially with Farmer John being a farmer and elected official. Well, that is absolutely forbidden in China. The farmer has no say. And they made that very clear. They, um, they ran the produce. They told who was going to farm what and where. And the farmers really work for the government. And this body that came um, are the decision makers. And they were very interested in, in our farmers' markets and how we distribute food. And we say we have a, a great movement of farmers' markets in all of the cities here, too. So it was an interesting exchange. So they were fascinated that why we um, weren't using the hilltops and using every piece of land because they do in China. So uh, that's always interesting. So uh, that's all I have to report for right now. Um, we'll go to the city manager, and, which has several updates, um, specifically on the storm as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, starting with the status of Measure F, and I'm going to ask for assistance from the city attorney on that item. Thank you, Mayor Fraser's members of the city council. This is actually a status on Measure F, which was approved by the voters on the, at the June 3rd um, statewide primary election as well as the Main Street Bridge Preservation Act, which uh, was adopted as an ordinance by the City Council on June 17th after um, a citizen-sponsored ballot initiative qualified uh, otherwise for the November ballot. So under the Elections Code, in that circumstance, when a measure qualifies for the ballot, the City Council has the option of either placing it on the ballot or adopting it as an ordinance, in which case it has the same effect as a um, uh, a measure that's approved by the voters. Um, the two measures are substantively identical but have different wording in terms of the whereas or the recital provisions of those measures. Um, both measures, uh, however, are similar in that they uh, protect the Main Street Bridge from any future expansion or destruction without a uh, approval of the majority of the voters at a, at a subsequent uh, election. They're both uh, similar in that they uh, um, call for an amendment to the city's local coastal program, which is a feature that has to be certified by the California Coastal Commission. Um, the process generally for amending the local coastal program is specified by the city's LCP and, in the, coast, and the Coastal Act. And in a nutshell, without going through it in too much detail, it requires that a public hearing be held both before the Planning Commission and the City Council before uh, the measures can be submitted to the Coastal Commission, which then, before it can take effect, uh, has to certify it as consistent with the Coastal Act and the existing uh, local coastal program land use plan. These measures had a, the effect of both taking effect immediately upon their approval by the voters, but also as requiring the city to submit them for certification to the Coastal Commission. Um, the process that's outlined in the Coastal Act was initially followed in this case with the Planning Commission uh, having reviewed the measures at a meeting in September and recommending that they be approved by the Council and forward to the Commission for certification. Uh, a public hearing was then noticed for the November 18th City Council meeting 
for the city council to consider um, approving those measures for certification by the Coastal Commission. Uh, and it was in reviewing that report um, for the November 18th meeting that um, I became aware of case law that essentially holds that the process for uh, adopting a ballot measure under the elections code, uh, which, is a, which is a way that voters have of uh, amending city ordinances that become, uh, take the same effect as a, a, an ordinance that's adopted by the city council, that it serves essentially as a substitute for the ordinary public hearing process that's outlined in the Coastal Act. And so therefore that requiring that it go through the Planning Commission and City Council for further adoption before sending to the Coastal Commission for certification was unnecessary and in fact not appropriate. Um, it was also in reviewing the report for that November 18th meeting that I uh, became aware of uh, a requirement in both measures that they be submitted to the cert to the Coastal Commission for certification within 60 days of their adoption by the voters, which would have been sometime in August. Um, that fact, although I had a hand in drafting Measure F, uh, was overlooked by me, and so therefore uh, that obviously didn't occur in this case. Uh, since it has been since submitted to the Coastal Commission for certification, and hopefully the commission will approve it as a minor amendment to the local coastal program so that it will take effect um, early in 2015. One other issue that, it, that uh, has been raised um, by Council Member Ruddick uh, prior to this evening's meeting is the fact that in 2011, when the council amended the local coastal program in Title 18 of the of the local coastal program is the zoning code for the city of Half Moon Bay. Chapter 1839, which was the, which was the chapter um, that contained the section of uh, the code that was amended by the Main Street Preser Bridge Preservation Act was moved out of Title 18. So um, the effect of that now is that the language of both the Main Street Bridge Preservation Act and Measure F will stand alone in uh, Title 18 as the sole section of Chapter 1839. Substantively, it has no effect because um, all those measures did was amend, um, I think, 1839.050 to make them more restrictive, uh, specifically as pertains to the Main Street Bridge. And so um, it doesn't otherwise modify the code. And, and that section stands alone as a um, separate provision by itself, but nevertheless, it is significant and something that I suspect that the Coastal Commission will have to reconcile when it considers certification of both measures. I'm happy to answer any questions or comments, um, but otherwise that concludes my report. Thank you, Tony. I'll probably follow up with some questions on that later. Thank Not you. this evening, but any other time. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so I'm um, just to touch on a, I've got actually a long list of reports and we'll try to make them brief given the length of this agenda. Um, you touched a little bit on the storm that we just had and I just want to echo some of the comments that council members and the mayor have made. Uh, we were lucky to have some advance warning and people did prepare, did take it seriously. Um, as you mentioned, we activated the uh, EOC at level one. It was a good exercise, good learning, had lots of partners there. Um, our fabulous staff, a very, very small staff, was out in advance cleaning out storm drains, making sure that things were well, well prepared. Um, they did a very good job of making sure that they were cleared out. I, I sent you a note, and just for the benefit of the rest of the community, uh, our biggest concern, our biggest issues were those around the ditch. As you know, we were ditches. As you know, we've not been able to clean those for some time. Um, we did have to get into the ditch on an emergency basis uh, for the ditch on Magnolia Street. The water was um, going over the top, across the street, and into neighbors' homes. Uh, we were able to clear that. Uh, our wave crest was also um, overflowing, and the water was all the way across the street and over the top. So um, we had some fallen trees. Uh, luckily, no one was hurt that we know. 
Uh, we were able to respond very quickly through our partners up and down, as you know, the EOC is for the entire coast, not just the um, Half Moon Bay. So we had um, Caltrans and the county and others responding to the calls that we were receiving and pr pretty quickly, uh, so that went well. Uh, tonight, we have another storm. Um, our staff is out assessing the area. Our superintendent, I don't think, is here. He's wearing a yellow jacket, so I would have seen him. Um, he will hopefully be here for the public works discussion that's on the agenda later, but he's out assessing now. Um, Council Member Kowalczyk is not here. Vice Mayor Kowalczyk is not here because he's probably stuck on 92. Um, I've been told that uh, eastbound 92 uh, is flooded at Spanish Town, so they're down to one lane. Uh, so that's what's happening there. North Main Street is also flooded. Uh, Wavecrest uh, Street has been closed. There's overflowing of the ditch again this evening. Um, and there has been, um, from the last storm already, we had some pretty major, con more erosion at the Seymour Bridge. So we're very concerned about that. Don't know what's gonna happen there. And depending on what happens with tonight's storm, because the rain came down very quickly again this evening, we don't know what will happen there. But we're sending somebody out. Uh, we're gonna try to get somebody out there as soon as possible to evaluate the situation and make sure that it's safe. So we'll continue to monitor and we'll hope for more rain, but very slow rain um, as we move forward. And then moving on to um, the general plan process. I've got a couple of notes here. Um, again, as you know, in an effort to update, the, the general plan effort is for updating the general plan and the local coastal program. And the intention there is to create an ongoing dialogue with the community for what the future of Half Moon Bay will look like. Uh, the adoption of the general plan is not expected to occur within the next, not till at least the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, but the process requires public input to help shape its goals and various draft policy proposals. As you know, there have been, there are three concepts that have been developed um, as a way to attempt to show a, a wide range of options so that we, it's intended to be a guide for an, um, having people provide, to start the dialogue. It's not intended to be a final plan. It's not a pick one or the other. It's just to prompt the dialogue so that people can provide us input in terms of what they like, what they see, how does it look, how does it feel as a, as a prompter, essentially. So none of the decisions are final. Uh, most recently, the Planning Commission, in terms of our process, the planning, condition, the planning Commission conducted a study session on December 9th, and we're scheduled to bring um, a study session to this council on, on January 20th. So again, just in terms of process. Um, and I just wanna be very clear that uh, no decisions have been made to this point. We're really just in the early stages of trying to gather more input from the community. And I would like to try to bring um, an update on the general plan on a regular basis so we can keep the community informed about what's happening with that process. Um, Night of Lights touched on it a little bit, but if I could just mention it as well. Um, I, we had the open house, as you know, very excited about that. We had lots of people come in. Uh, people signed up for SMC alert. Hopefully they did, because they will have gotten the alerts with the storm and know what's happening there. Uh, we were able to show off a lot of the projects that we are working on. Um, it was interesting, we had some hot cider and um, cookies, and that's what we had to use to entice people to come in, because as we were, I was out in the street trying to get folks to come in, and they were looking at me very oddly and saying, what's going on at City Hall at this hour? <laughs> uh, so they finally would come in, uh, had some hot cider, and most importantly, I think for us, for the staff, is um, making sure that the community understands that this is their City Hall and for the community so that we can start building relationships with the community so that it's um, oftentimes behind that kind of artificial uh, institutional counter. Uh, and so we wanna make sure we start building relationships with the community. So it was a success and we have some things that we learned and we hope to do it again in the future. Um, and then just a, a couple of other quick announcements, a, a reminder that City Hall will be closed for the holidays from December 24th through January 2nd. So we'll be back. Um, <coughs> open again on January 5th, which is the Monday. And then finally, at the back table there, um, there's neighborhood connections. It's sort of an electronic update, although we printed it for tonight's uh, meeting to make it available. It's on the website as well. The community development uh, director, Dante Hall, and his staff has been, have been putting this together. I think this might be the third uh, time he's put it out. It's just a way to keep inf people in informed. Again, we're trying to do more in terms of information, sharing information. So. This is just another avenue to let folks know what's going on in the department, so I encourage people to take one with them. 
and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. We will go now to public forum. If anyone has anything they'd like to talk about, please fill out one of these blue cards. You can get them over there. And before we begin, I see we have some scouts in the audience tonight. Thank you for being here. If, if there's anything we can help you with or anything um, of, of note you want to point out, um, talk to, raise your hand there, Alex. Um, talk to Alex over there. He, he can help you out. So we'll go to public forum now. We have several cards. We'll first would be David Oblovi, followed by Brant Turner. Let's go ahead now. Let's just keep rolling. No, that's what I'm saying. You, you can, I've got other cards here for other stuff, but please go to the next person. Okay, so you're not going to talk at public forum? No, I'm good. Got it. Thank you. Brent Turner followed by Jimmy Benjamin. Hello. Uh, thanks for doing the good work for the city. And uh, good to see all of you here tonight on this rainy night. My name is Brent Turner. I'm a local real estate broker. I own Turner Real Estate. Uh, we don't do a tremendous amount of business here in the city limits, but uh, we do a good amount of business statewide. And I wanted to just uh, mention to you regarding the general plan that uh, we've been having good conversation for years with the United States Green Building Council. And so moving toward conversations uh, surrounding the general plan, I'd like to uh, make available information from the United States Green Building Council regarding uh, different elements, uh, lead certification and such, so that we're getting the opinion of some of these uh, organizations that have been successful in planning uh, with a, an eye towards sustainability. Obviously, I think at this point, we're all very familiar with the word transparency as it's bandied about quite often, but, uh, and I don't know of any transparency issues attached to the studies, but I would implore you to move forward with great transparency and also giving some attention to recommendations that might be provided by the U.S. Green Building Council, and I'm glad to be a liaison to that group if that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Jimmy Benjamin, followed by Dan Haggerty. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, and staff. Uh, I'm Jimmy Benjamin. I live at 400 Pilocitos Avenue. Um, you have a very long agenda, and I don't want to make it any longer. Um, but that actually is one of the points I wanted to make tonight. Um, with our uh, freshman council member uh, on the agenda, I think it's regrettable that uh, her first agenda is a 600-page um, agenda. I think it would have been really helpful if we had had uh, the possibility of a workshop, particularly with respect to the budget, um, in an afternoon study session where she could sort of wade in. I'm sure each of you remember what it was like when you were a freshman and I think it's an incredibly challenging job to receive the report on Friday afternoon and be able to act on it uh, knowledgeably um, so quickly with so little experience. It would be really nice if there were a way that we could, for future new large things, if we could find a way to bring those workshops and help usher her and uh, any other council members who want to refresh her into that process. I think that the public might also be interested in those. Uh, second, I wanted to comment briefly on the storm drainage. Uh, I want to echo uh, Councilmember Moeller and uh, Mayor Frazier's uh, praise of staff. I want to particularly call out Bob Eastman, who was uh, a picture of calm at the sandbag filling site uh, next to the train station. Uh, John Hernandez, who I saw clearing drainage at the Roosevelt uh, drainage. Uh, I am also concerned about the Pullman drainage that uh, Mayor Moeller saw. He was actually at at the upstream end near uh, the Devich house. I was at the downstream, as it turns out, near the Gradstein's house. And uh, I was shocked by the amount of water that was flowing out of the existing path into uh, a full drainage. It was creating a hydraulic behavior that you don't need to be a, a soils engineer or a hydrologist to know is creating incredible erosion. And the, the, those trees are really the only difference between whole scale erosion on one side and just the bad erosion that's happening. And it's clear that the drainage in that area needs to find a way to get out to the open space, which is a really good opportunity to make use of the PUD when a specific plan is developed there. Uh, I also observe erosion in uh, the uh, Kehoe watercourse, and although I did not see erosion in the Roosevelt drainage, 
when I looked at it midday on the big storm day, it was full to the banks. And it's a real concern, as you may recall, because in that area, the planners, I just don't know what they were thinking, because the houses are built right up. There is no floodplain there. And it's clear that the Pullman and Roosevelt drainages need to be able to get out to the open space next to them, or we will continue to have problems. With respect to the Kehoe water course, I'd like to report that Pilositos Avenue at the south terminus close to the Kehoe water course has actually changed as a result of the flows. There's actually a noticeable tilt, I'll finish quickly, uh, and it's, it's very worrisome. So I think we need to think beyond the flooding and think about the, both dimensions, flooding and erosion, as we plan our drainage. It should be a central feature of our general plan update. Thank you. Thank you. And Dan Haggerty is our last card. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, and a warm welcome to uh, Council Member Ruddick and Penrose. Um, regarding the updated general plan, I want to say do not allow the tragedy of the commons to occur here in Half Moon Bay and the coast side. Do not allow unchecked development to graze all remaining fields, which would destroy the reasons why this is such a cherished place to be for our residents and visitors. <clears throat> As government leaders, you need to respect the wishes of the public. Do not make large plans which will have an everlasting effect. <clears throat> um, take action to keep Half Moon Bay and the coast side, the right size for those who love it the way it is. Question those projected numbers. We're supposed to have this by that year. Why, was, why must we destroy what we have to meet some quota? I'm not per se anti-development, but for smart development, and everything should be to small town scale. That's why those that us that live here, moved here. <clears throat> and that's why <clears throat> visitors love this place so much. <clears throat> the people have spoken, so please acknowledge and respect their wishes. Um, this is a very special place, and, and it should be, um, it should remain the same for, for everybody to enjoy. Uh, I'd like to, we were talking a lot about um, drainage. Um, I want to make a report that uh, um, Servers Beach, <clears throat> Highway 1, is, uh, is it's, it's eroding fast. We've lost the access. You have to now jump down about two feet to get to the beach. So if someone jumps down, I don't know how they're going to get back. Um, the rocks are unstable, uh, the riprap. There is, uh, there's a culvert underneath Highway 1, um, immediately north, uh, just across from the Surfers Beach parking lot, which is tilting inward towards the ocean. It's a, it's a two, um, it's a two passage drain, culvert. There's water flowing through one of them, one of the passages. The other passage is I jumped down there this evening and looked in there. It's, it's jam-packed. There's not a drip of water flowing out of it. It's dammed, so it's obvious that on the other side of the dam, water is building up, and when that happens, pressure happens, and so the, the water saturates everything around it, and this is most likely the reason why the, the whole uh, most westward part, portion of the culvert is, is actually tilting uh, you can look in the hole. There's no earth around it at all. It's just bare. I don't know why it hasn't fallen yet. Uh, it is attached to the rest of the culvert, but and there are rocks in front, but it's it's definitely settling. Uh, I know the county knows about it. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know who's. Comments, pardon? Sir? You want to wrap up your comments, sir? Yeah, no. I just want to finish up on this Great. important, uh, you know, noticing of the uh, situation up there. So, um, you know, I don't know who is responsible, uh, whether it's Caltrans. I understand, uh, I don't, 
I was told that that is Half Moon Bay city limits right in this area, so it gets really complicated as to who's responsible. So I wanted to make sure that the city council of Half Moon Bay is aware of it. Um, your residents use that road on a regular basis, and um, you know we don't want to have. Uh, uh, well, it's it, it it appears to be in a close to emergency situation. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your comments on Fortnite. We'll pass that along to the county and Caltrans as well. Thank you. All right. We move now to consent calendar. We have items one through thirteen. Madam Mayor, if I may, uh, if I may, um, I'd like to request that we continue a few items. Um, I'm interested in re in continuing from the consent calendar item number eight, which is the CAFR. Item number nine, which is the mid-year budget amendments. And from the, I think it's a public hearing portion of the agenda, item number 14, which is the housing element. Um, as a member of the public has mentioned, this is a large agenda. Um, and we, as you know, we've uh, had the reorg meeting in December. Therefore, this is only one substantive meeting for uh, December. We also had council the meeting in uh, November, the first meeting of November as a result of the election. And because we have a closure of City Hall during the holidays, it's uh, impossible to have in the packet for the first week, for the first meeting in January. So November, December, and January have one council meeting. So uh, regrettably, this is a large agenda. Um, but having said that, I, I would like to mention that I did receive several questions from a few council members regarding these items. Um, and the interest, similar to what was expressed by the community member, uh, I guess in s similar thought of a, a couple of council members were interested in having some si sort of a workshop, perhaps on a couple of the items specifically, again, as mentioned, um, the financial items, the CAFR, and perhaps the housing element. We'd be happy to uh, do that and provide that. And we've been able to check and we can, th there's no time um, restrictions that need to make this, that, w that uh, require for us to take this up this evening. So we can still bring it to the uh, second meeting in January. I don't know what that date is, but that second meeting in January. Um, happy to do that and happy to then try to schedule some kind of a workshop or whatever that might be while we'll work with the mayor to figure out the best form to make that happen. Uh, and really our interest is to make sure that we are providing the best information to the council so the council can make the best decisions possible. So that would be my request. Again, items 8, 9, and 14. All right. Thank you. That's, um, that's good. Those are complicated issues, and I'm glad they're not time sensitive, that we can take some time on them. Good. I would also like to pull item 6. It's the Coastal Conservancy grant, but as I am employed by the grantor, I would like to be able to recuse myself from that. And uh, I understand that there's, that Mr. Benjamin would like to pull item 10. You know, is that 10 for discussion and nine, or excuse me, um, six is for discussion or you would just abstain from this item? I'll actually recuse myself and step down. Okay. Not to make it even more confusing. Um, <laughs> go right ahead. Maybe we just go through the one by one because I want to pull item number nine. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, item number 13, please. Uh, I'm sorry, say that one again. Item number 13. Item number 13. And that's for discussion? It's for discussion. Okay. So, 13. Right. Give it a shot, Councilmember Muller. I will move on the consent calendars item one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I'm not quite sure if item six would need to be pulled, uh, Council Member Ruddick. I think if you could just recuse on that item. But legal attorney, would you give me some advice on that one? Unless you have discussion on it. I, I believe that's correct, but I haven't had a chance to review that before this evening's meeting. So I think as a precaution, maybe Council Member okay. Ruddick should, should go ahead and formally recuse. Yeah. And I, I would actually like to you know, actually step down from the dais. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's probably prudent in the absence of my having researched that prior to this evening. Thank you for that clarification. So then we will continue on with the consent calendar of item seven. Oh, um, and the city clerk has let me know that there was an agenda item number five pull from a member of the public. Five? Number five. 
Okay, so uh, we will remove uh, item five from the consent uh, and item six from the consent. Those are pulled. Back to consent item seven. Uh, item eight will be continued. Item nine will be continued. Item 10 will be pulled. Item 11, consent calendar. Item 12, consent calendar. Item 13, pulled. And that is my motion. Well done. Do we have a second on that? I'll, I'll, I'll second. Penrith has a first second. Thank you. <laughs> now, can we have, um, should we go voice or go individual? Go roll call. Yes. 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 Thank you. So we will go now to um, do I do we want to hear five, six, and ten now or leave that till the end of the agenda? Okay, um, we'll hear item number five, and this was pulled by a member of the public. This was Pam Fisher. I'm not sure it's even appropriate, but you'll forgive me if it isn't. Um, Jimmy Benjamin touched on it unexpectedly. Um, it's basically looking at policy and involved with budget issues and the interaction of the public where I came from, way across the country, against the Atlantic, um, we actually held budget hearings. I was on the school board there for seven years, but the city and the school board both had budget hearings with draft budgets, clearly marked draft, and they were essentially workshops, so the public could come and ask questions about um, any concerns that they had. It's one thing to see, maybe it's generational, but it's one thing to see it online, and it's an overwhelming document. And another thing to be able to look at your faces and ask, could you explain this to me, or what is what exactly is the issue with this particular item? So I'm just going to encourage um, a budget workshop of sorts so the public can interact and ask questions. They're not in this, a decision-making role, but it's for clarification. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the city manager, do you want to explain our, our budget process, how we start in January, go through June, and have several workshops on Yeah, that? I'm happy to. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, the, the purpose of the item is just what um, the speaker is referring to, I think. So um, I, I don't know if you've had the benefit of taking a look. So we do have several dates that lead up to the proposed budget. Um, that will go to the council, and it, we, I think we call it proposed here. Um, but it's essentially the same thing, kind of like a draft. And so the public is invited to attend these meetings. So that's why we put the dates out for the council and for the public. So um, this is a le at least a six month project process uh, for the next budget that will start July 1. And the council will get the proposed um, budget document. We'll try to get it to you two weeks before. So the study sessions are, the big study session will be on April 21st. And we'll try to get the um, document to you two weeks in advance of that so that the council has plenty of time to review it and it will be available uh, as well to the public um, online. Um, and we can certainly make a couple of copies available in the office if people are interested in taking a look at that. We're happy to do that. Thank you. Item number five, should we take that individually? Yes, yes. okay. Um, do we have a motion for item number five? Move to approve consent to item number five. And do we have a second? Second. So moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Yes. 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 Thank you. We'll go to item number six. And, and I will step down and recuse myself. <clears throat> I might suggest that you move that to the end of the agenda, uh, just to spare Council Member Ruddick having to leave and come back in. OK. That's it. We will have that at the end. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. And the next one would be item number 10. Don't remember who pulled that one. I believe that was Council Member Ruddick. Council Member Ruddick, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I actually have 
a question about voting on this first and that is since i was not a council member when you introduced this item and voted on it what are the rules about my voting on um, re-adoption it's not even adoption it's, it's re-adoption as i understand it yes this essentially is a legislative uh, or quasi-legislative decision at the city council it's not the same thing as a development application which is a quasi adjudicatory decision for which in order to uh, participate you would need to if you missed the first meeting rehabilitate yourself by studying the the packet and the and the and the discussion that took place at the first hearing so so you can uh, participate in this decision without having been at the the, the first hearing mm -hmm. uh, in in this case as a as a legal matter mm -hmm. uh, so I, I am concerned after looking at the various documents previously submitted by Mr. Benjamin um, that we're not including the Caltrans, the full Caltrans mitigation site as identified uh, in the documents related to that site from 1996. I understand there was a subsequent biological report that sort of reinterpreted the, the site and has been cited by, by staff uh, as justification for um, drawing up the map the way it, it currently is drawn. And I have read the staff report and I'm not clear as to why the city is, is using the, the, the 2005 Essex report in, instead of the, um, the mitigation site as uh, drawn up legally in uh, 1996. Um, first of all, I, I understand there was a letter submitted late this afternoon, and in fact, Mr. Benjamin was kind enough to hand me uh, another revised copy just as this meeting was getting underway. I haven't had a chance to review either of those. Um, I did review the materials that were submitted prior to um, the last city council meeting that evening as well. Um, as I recall from the evidence that was presented in the litigation, however, the Caltrans mitigation site was referred to in that by reference to um, testimony of a couple of biologists that were, or a biologist who was uh, involved in the litigation. And uh, although the, I don't believe the term was defined by reference to any particular city document in the settlement agreement, um, it was understood to mean the mitigation site as being the, uh, the wetland area that was constructed by Caltrans at the westernmost end of the city property. As I recall, um, that was was a, uh, an artificially created wetland that was designed to offset the impacts on some wetlands that were, um, that were eliminated as part of the Highway 92 widening project. That's my recollection from the evidence at trial, and that was the reference, as I understood it, in, in the settlement agreement, which formed the basis of this map amendment. So that's the way I understood it. Um, Mr. Benjamin disagrees. Uh, I don't dispute the good faith of that um, uh, disagreement, but um, having reviewed the, the, the initial submittal that I don't believe was presented when this uh, matter was first adopted uh, earlier this year, but now that it's been readopted and this additional information has been submitted, um, it doesn't change my recommendation. Um, regardless of how the council decides this, it's going to be sent up to the Coastal Commission for certification. And Mr. Benjamin, um, should the council proceed tonight, would still have the opportunity to make that argument to uh, the Coastal Commission. And, and they may disagree with me. I don't know. But, but that's how I interpret it. And we have a couple of cards from the public on this item. And Mr. Benjamin, since you're standing, you want to come forward, followed by David Oblovi, then Pam Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Condotti. I appreciate your, your summary. Um, I'll just say that, um, as I understand uh, our municipal code, um, terms that are not defined in agreement, that is, they're, they're words and phrases that are, are to be interpreted in a uh, common, uh, plain fashion. And uh, the Caltrans mitigation project site it seems to me should be defined in terms of the Caltrans mitigation project site map that appears in that document. That is the, the basis of thinking. As you know, our settlement agreement is to incorporate all of the conversations and discussions and other things 
and it, it is the sole basis for thinking about this. So I think it's really important to, to focus on the agreement. Um, that, I think, is the starting point. Um, the Caltrans mitigation project site uh, is larger than the 2.5 acres that was mentioned in uh, the staff report. I'm sure that was an inadvertent um, misunderstanding of what I wrote in November. Um, the map that I provided at the last meeting, uh, I've provided again tonight to each of the council members and earlier today to staff, um, shows the location of the Caltrans mitigation site. And the project makes it clear that the development didn't just take place in the refuse area that was remediated. The project wasn't just about creating a wetland, it was about removing a landfill. And the project site involved removing topsoil across a, a very large area, much larger than the former refuse site. In other words, development occurred over the entire site. There's really no ambiguity about what that site is, as I'm sure you'll see uh, when you read the, the information that I provided. And I, I respect the city attorney and the way he thinks about the problem. I think we have slightly different frames. Um, my guess is the project that's in front of you um, with proper evidence could be, a, there's a strong argument to be made that that is indeed um, a set of areas that are protected areas. And I would expect the Coastal Commission to be fine with that. The problem for me isn't that, that it's not fine to protect those areas, it's that it doesn't satisfy um, paragraph D4 of our settlement agreement that we signed. The city has the full benefit of that agreement in their hands. And as the other party to that agreement, I'm asking that you afford me the same benefit. I'm happy to answer any questions about this. And uh, rather than waste more time, the other information that I had for you is in, in my letter. So thank you again. I look forward to speaking with you if it will be helpful to you. Thank you. Mr. Blovey, followed by Ms. Fisher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, unlike Mr. Benjamin, I have not examined this particular topic to the nth degree that he has. In the end, to me, it's very simple. Mr. Benjamin sued the city for relief. He won. The city entered into a settlement agreement, which says quite clearly, City acknowledges that the following areas have been identified as habitats supporting or containing rare, endangered, threatened, or unique species. It cites the study that Mr. Condotti mentioned, and then it says specifically, B, Caltrans Mitigation Project Site, also as a wetland. So it identifies specifically and enumerates the Caltrans Project Site. Council members, this is the Caltrans Project Site as identified by the Caltrans Project Report. I'm here tonight to ask you specifically to deny, send this back to staff, and make it what you agreed to do when you settled with Mr. Benjamin. It's the only proper thing to do, and I don't know why it's not being done, quite frankly. But he's right. You agreed, the city agreed, to protect this area of property as enumerated here, and we're not doing it. This is up to you now. You can vote yes or you can vote no. I'd actually like to ask you to vote no. Thank you. I had an opportunity to visit this site yesterday, I believe, in the muck. Um, I want to second what Mr. Blovey has said, and as a citizen, I also want to express some degree of frustration with the amount of litigation that citizens are forced into um, partaking, you know, ent entering into with either the city or the school district, because simple compromise or simple um, agreements that have been, or complex agreements that have been made are not adhered to. That if the local coastal plan is being, uh, uh, being observed and the municipal, the municipal ordinances are being observed, there should be no need to take this back. And of course, Mr. Benjamin has every opportunity to take this right back to uh, the Coastal Commission. However, let's try to avoid that. That's what I'm asking you people to do. I am sick to death of the amount of money. Mr. Condotti has an opportunity, he has a, an every right to make a living. But I also want to say it's city staff time. Every minute people spend on these arguments is costing the taxpayers money. 
because you could be doing other things as well. So my encouragement is to look at the settlement, try to abide by it, don't dig your heels in, and let's try to come to consensus over this argument. Thank you. Council, any comments, questions? Well, I, I think I'd like to just uh, reiterate what the uh, city attorney said, that we have spent years and uh, a great deal of uh, money and, and energy on the settlement agreement here. I don't see this as a, a major stumbling block. I think as our city attorney gives us legal advice, uh, I would recommend as a council we listen to uh, the best legal advice uh, that he's offering us. So uh, I have no problem with uh, readopting this ordinance uh, unless the uh, city attorney can state something in a recent uh, handout here letter that was just given to us uh, earlier, which is an uncomfortable situation uh, to analyze that right away. Uh, as I said, I haven't had a chance to review it, but um, I, I will take Mr. Benjamin at his word that it's essentially a, a reiteration of the prior letter. Um, but again, I haven't had a chance to review it. And so your recommendation is still to continue with staff's uh, recommendation here? <clears throat> um, as I said, I, I don't believe that there would be anything in the information that would cause me to uh, revisit that recommendation. I, I would point out, as I think it was Mr. Ablovi pointed out, the reference to the settlement agreement refers to areas that have been identified as a habitat for California red-legged frogs, as well as wetlands. Those are specifically the areas that are at the very westernmost end of the what Mr. Benjamin refers to as the project site that um, were modified by Caltrans as mitigation for the wetlands that they removed on Highway 92. So, so that language to me supports uh, the position that I've outlined. Uh, it doesn't undermine it. Councilman Quacha. Um, so just a quick question for city attorney. So, uh, so in, in me reviewing this today, I, d I just want to revalidate and just to ask you explicitly that uh, in your professional opinion, this is consistent with um, existing settlement agreements, this direction? Uh, it, it is in my opinion, um, and, and I would just also reiterate the suggestion that, um, uh, that the need to submit this for the, to the Coastal Commission for its approval uh, is, is an unnecessary expense, but it, in fact, that's exactly what uh, is required of the city because this is a, an amendment to the habitat areas and water resources overlay maps that are part of your LCP, so they don't become effective unless they are uh, approved and certified by the Coastal Commission. Thank you. So this goes back to the Coastal Commission, so there is still consideration and examination. So I'm also comfortable that's with right. this item. Thank you. Councilman Penrose. Yes, I, I think I'm not really understanding the objection to including the rest of the uh, project area. I don't, I don't know why it's, it's being limited. Um, I can address that briefly. The, the area of the Caltrans uh, wetland project is approximately, I believe, two and a half acres, whereas the whole site, um, perhaps uh, Council Member Muller could help me out, but I wanna, I wanna say it's in the range of 20, 25 acres. So it's a much larger site. It extends all the way from the west end of the, where the sand plant is, all the way to the Lutheran Church adjacent to Highway 1. So it would be applying those habitat restrictions to a much larger area of city-owned property. Um, there's nothing that would prohibit the council from doing that, and that's a policy decision for you to make should you decide to, to do that. Um, you know, that, that would be something that I would completely support and respect, but uh, it, in my opinion, it's not required under the terms of the settlement agreement. So, so I think that's the distinction. And again, it's a policy decision for the council to make. You, should, you certainly could determine that that entire area should be identified as uh, a wetland or red-legged frog habitat. Councilman Reddick. <clears throat> From a risk management perspective, uh, given the fact that we've had ongoing litigation 
uh, with Mr. Benjamin, I would think that it would be wise to uh, interpret the settlement agreement um, as broadly as possible and in include the whole site. I think that just makes sense to me to protect ourselves. Uh, from a natural resources point of view, um, you know, wetland is more than just a, a pond or a, or a lake or, or a marsh. It includes um, the buffers, it includes upland areas so that, you know, water and plants can migrate and animals as well. Animals use upland areas to sun themselves, to um, sometimes mate, uh, things like that. So I think, you know, we need to look at it as sort of an ecosystem as opposed to just a simple, you know, drainage. And I think the Coastal Act requires us also to make the most protective interpretation. So um, I, I would recommend that we that we include the entire site as spelled out in the um, you know the, the legal description of the um, original mitigation site from 1996, and then send that along to the Coastal Commission. Councilmember Muller. Well, I, I believe uh, I respectfully disagree. I think uh, it's about. 10 acres there, and then the Lutheran Church owns about five also. Uh, and for their future uh, expansion program or gardening program or whatever, I think it's very important to, to be very sensitive to that area there. So uh, uh, I'm still in favor of uh, staff's recommendation. Council, any more questions of staff or comments? If not, I would uh, like to make a motion uh, to readopt an ordinance amending the city's local coastal plan, LCP, land use plan, and implementation of plan by re revising the habitat areas and water resource overlay map and coastal resource areas map to reflect areas in the city containing sensitive coastal resources in the U-R urban reserve and P-S public service zoning districts. Is there a second? I'll second. If there is no more discussion or comment? I think uh, just to be clear, uh, with, uh, regardless of its vote in this direction, we'll see which direction it's going to go. There's still room for discussion when this goes to the Coastal Commission. And regardless of that outcome, there will be plenty of time and room for sunning and mating of the animals and the and this property. So I'm sure they'll, they'll all do fine either way. And uh, right, Thank you. We have a roll call vote, please. No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. All right, motion passes three to two. Thank you for the discussion. That was item number 10. We go on to, we've got, we will go now to 13. Thank you. I, I pulled that item. I uh, just wanted to make a, a, a point and a, a comment. And um, I don't, Alex, if you have any additional to say after this, but I wanted to put out item number 13 um, is that this repair to uh, sewer spot repair was done within the city of Half Bay. And Deborah, you probably know this, and Deborah, you probably don't know this yet. Um, because it was done within the city limits, then the city paid, I think, was it fifty-eight thousand dollars, and that we paid one hundred percent of that of that amount for those repairs in our city, which makes logical sense. That's our sewer in our city. However, I want to just make the point, and you may not be aware, that if this repair were done in El Granada or Montera, the city of Half Moon Bay would pay fifty percent of the cost for that repair because of our contract, uh, um, the contract for SAM, which is our our binding arrangement with the, the other member agencies. So I, I just took this as the opportunity to raise that so we understand that, that we're footing the bill for our repairs and half of the repairs outside the city. Correct, Alex? So it's repairs uh, for SAM property. So um, that would be the inner type pipe system, so the eight-mile pipeline, and then the pump stations that are all to the north uh, outside the city limits as well. But each uh, just sanitary district, they take care of their uh, small sewer mains. But it's that main system. Uh, getting the waste down here to the Half Moon Bay treatment plant or the SAM treatment plant. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to point that out so we're, we're, we know where the money is going and when it's in our city and not. So that's something long term we, we are interested in looking at and examining how we can find a, a more uh, balanced agreement for the member agencies. 
And if there's no, if I may make a motion. Uh, I move to accept consent item number 13. Can I have a second, please? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Aye. Yes. 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 And thank you for the explanation. We have item number 14 pulled, and that ends our consent agendas until item number six later in the evening. So we will go now to item number 15, and this is to reaffirm City of Half Moon Bay Council Code of Responsible Practices. And we will have a report from our city clerk, Siobhan Smith. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Before you is the City of Half Moon Bay City Council Code of Responsible Practices. This code was developed and approved by the City Council in 2012 with the intention that the code be revisited, reaffirmed, and signed by members of the City Council on an annual basis. Uh, please note that this code of responsible practices doesn't supplant other laws and rules and responsibilities of city officials. Rather, it's designed to provide clear guidelines for council in dealing with the public and staff and other elected officials. Uh, city council members are always expected to comply with the regulations of the Brown Act and the Municipal Code and, and the FPPC and the California Government Code. Uh, staff's recommendation is for council to review the city council code of responsible practices, which was included in your packet this evening, make any desired revisions, and then reaffirm the city council code of responsible practices. And, and then staff will um, forward the code to individual council members for signature, and they'll be kept on file in my office. And that concludes the report, and we are available to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you. Council, have you had a chance to review and have anything to add or comment on? I'd just like to point out that I um, Googled these things, and um, a lot of cities in California and throughout the country have them, and everybody seems to have a unique one, and some of them focus more on the responsibilities of the council and some more on the responsibilities of the public. So, um, you know, we might, when we have a, a council retreat, just um, take time to, to review it and, and maybe see some other samples and see if it really addresses, you know, our, our needs. I think it's important to have meeting decorum, and um, so I don't really see this as a sort of a code of, you know, meeting decorum, which I think is sort of needed. On the other hand, I don't want to have, you know, a strict code that makes people feel like they, they can't participate fully. Or, or comment and, and things like that. So I might want to take a review of this uh, during our retreat if, if we can set aside a, a little time and look at alternatives, if that's okay. I mean, in the meantime, I'm happy to support it. Yeah, I mean, there's no rule that says we can't revisit it more often than mm -hmm. annually. We just want to check in with you once a year and make sure that you know, it mm -hmm. still gets signed. Yeah. Good, and thank you for that recommendation. If you have any particular ones that you've, you've seen, that would be great we'll to take bring a look samples at it and up. See if we continue to like it and sure. add things. Or... Well, great. Any co other comments? Yeah, so I, I think this is a really good idea, and if, if anybody's here from the sewer authority, oh, there he is. Um, you know, we, we brought this topic up, um, Rob, before your tenure, but uh, we, we also uh, want to adopt a similar commitment to, to the way we, we interact uh, on Sam, and so I'll bring this back up with Sam as well, but I'll also support this. And if there's no other comments, I'm happy to make a motion. Okay. Okay. I move to reaffirm and adopt the City of Hefferman Bay City Council Code of Responsible Practices. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Aye. Yeah, I think we have to get back to this I thing, so thank you for that. I. Yes. I. I. All right, motion passes. Thank you, and we'll follow up on this. We go now to item number 16 adopt a resolution setting the 2015 residential dwelling unit allocation. And we will be hearing from Dante. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, this is the annual duty um, that the City Council has of setting the residential allocation for the following year. Um, this is pursuant to Measure D, 
um, that was approved in 1999 um, that amended the residential growth limitation ordinance that uh, reduced the allowable units in any given year from 3% to 1% and an additional 5.5% uh, in the downtown area. Um, the city ordinance requires that the city council establish the maximum number of units um, for the following year by December 31st of this year. Uh, Bruce Ambo is our planning manager and he will walk us through uh, a very brief analysis of uh, Measure D and the allocation and we'll answer any questions if, if needed. Bruce. Thank you, Dante, Mayor and Council, thank you. Just uh, as Dante indicated, uh, we do this on an annual basis. Uh, it's required to be acted on in December, so we're setting the allocation for 2015. To give you a little bit of background, it is the allocation formula is key to population growth and the number of uh, permits, uh, people there are per household uh, in, in Half Moon Bay and the number of permits that we've been issuing. So I'll, I'll cruise through this kind of quickly here, but just to kind of sum it up, residential growth has been pretty mild for the past 10 years. In fact, um, even though we allocate 1%, we've been doing far less than that. We've been averaging about 19 for the past 10 years from 2004 to 2014. So, and our, our allocation allowances have ranged from 142 units to 74 down to last year and what we're recommending again this year. So we're falling far below um, what we've estimated for an allocation buildout. Um, again, um, to date, in 2014, we've issued 14 major deallocations, still far below the 74 that were uh, initially allocated. And in our next slide here, you can see where we've been for the past five years. Uh, we keyed the new population estimates to the census data from 2010. So we've been averaging 72 up to 74 last year, and we're recommending 74 again for 2015. As you can see, the total number of units that we've issued, uh, respectively, from 2010 to 14 were eight, six, eight, seven, and again, 14 for this year. And so lastly, uh, what we're recommending again is 74 uh, allocations to be distributed 1% across the whole city with an additional 5% for downtown. And you can see the breakdown that breaks down to 49 units downtown and outside uh, downtown 25. Uh, I know it's a lengthy package. You know, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of information in there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Well, thank you. And um, thank you, Bruce, and, and Council Member Penrose. Yes, I get, my question is, where does this map of the downtown area come from, and why does it look the way it does? You know, uh, that very was- a strange map. Yes, that's referred to as the downtown area. My suspicion is, is that that corresponds and I'll need to get back to you because this was in the original um, um, Measure D from 1999. But um, my suspicion is, is that map corresponds to the Main Street Master Plan uh, specific plan area. And I'll bet that's right, but I will get back to the council to confirm it. And but I, I understand it's awkward. And, and just additionally, um, I believe that is true also um, it is actually codified. It was codified, I think it was Measure A, actually, in 1993, and then it was reapproved in 1999, and the uh, allocation was adjusted. So the map was actually codified um, in 1993 and carried over until 1999. I believe that the area actually um, is the same specific plan area uh, for the downtown. Thank you. And, and I should say that we have the expert on Measure D. Um, we have Council Member Ruddick to thank for that, and she is the authority and can explain more about that. Uh, yeah, as the author of Measure D, or principal author, um, yeah, it, it, it's the redevelopment map, the downtown redevelopment map. It seemed to make sense for the purposes of 
what we thought at the time about concentrating you know development or at least you know rewarding development in the downtown area and that was the best map we had at the time so um, I'd like to point out something else too and that is that uh, measure D does not require the city to allocate um, five percent to um, the downtown core area uh, it's available and the city council may allocate the additional five percent over one percent but it doesn't it's not required to it, it is optional so half percent point five point five thank you for that and um, we do have a card from the public um, Mike Farrar Just push the little green button there. Well, my name's Mike Pereira. Uh, once was on the council and had some involvement in this. And Debbie actually stole my line. That is the redevelopment map. And as a redevelopment map, it did redevelopmenty things, which was there was neighbors, there were neighborhoods downtown that didn't want any part of it, so they weren't included. There was open space that was included because redevelopment money might be used to buy a park there. And the sewer plant got included because redevelopment money might be used to update it. It was the only map available at the time, I believe, that, that, measured, that would, could be referenced as a downtown map. And I would just suggest that you might want to, now that you no longer have the specter of redevelopment involved, to do a more rational map of downtown as a, an amendment to uh, Measure D. And I also want to uh, uh, address uh, what Councilmember Ruddick said about the 0.5% was that it was discretionary. And the practice used to be that staff would bring to the council what they thought might be needed over the 1%, and the council would give that amount up to the half percent. And uh, it's a fun process. It's the council exercising its discretion, doing what the people voted it to do. So it would be a good practice to resume. Thank you. Thank you. Any more discussion, council? Entertain a motion. Move per staff. Second. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Thank you for making the motion. That was appropriate. You did that. All right. We move now to item number 17, and this is Public Works Maintenance Division Needs Assessment. And we will be hearing from Alex. All right, good evening, Ms. Mayor and members of the council. Alex Kojikian, Deputy City Manager here for this great city. Um, tonight, I uh, am bringing forward a public works needs assessment. So going through just a little bit of background. So what this affects is the Public Works Facility Maintenance Division here uh, within the city. It is completely run by in-house city employees. Uh, the division provides maintenance of city-owned buildings, grounds, parks, streets, sidewalks that abut, city facilities, signs, trails, street lights, and drainage. Uh, there's a direct correlation between the operations of the Public Works Division and how the community looks aesthetically and general public safety. So currently the department's operating in a react, or the division is operating in a reactionary uh, state rather than a proactive state in maintaining city infrastructure due to the limited number of staff. So we currently have three staff members for a six square mile city. So this kind of goes over the staff and I can give you a little bit of history. So in 2008, due to budgetary and legal issues, uh, the city's public works facility maintenance division staff was cut by 66%. It went from nine full-time employees uh, down to what we have today of three full-time employees. 
Uh, you guys, the city commissioned an organizational assessment of uh, city operations back in March of 2013. And with that, the matrix study recommended uh, two additional public works maintenance employees at the time uh, to come on about 12 to 18 months. And we're right about there at the, eight, yeah, a little over the 18 months, but we're about right there. Um, and basically what they had in their analysis was that it's to increase the capacity uh, to maintain infrastructure at desired levels. So tonight's proposal, uh, what I'm asking for right now, I'm doing it incrementally. Um, take the first bite at the apple of uh, trying to get one additional uh, public works maintenance worker at this time. And this will help protect our city resources. And then uh, city staff will continue to evaluate this uh, over the next six months and see how it goes once we get uh, a person on board. So uh, the reasons why we're looking at getting an additional public works maintenance worker, uh, the city council is uh, going forward with a couple new projects that are going to be coming online, some new facilities, and with that, if you're going to go ahead and invest in such uh, public spaces and new facilities, you want to have that maintenance up to par so that you guys can go ahead and protect your guys' initial investment. Uh, over a long period of time. And so you have Mac Dutra Park that you guys approved the design at the last meeting. You have the skate park that will be next door that will be coming to you uh, in the near future. And then uh, the library that you guys are looking at build, building as well. The other item is, is parks. So our parks, some majority of our parks right now currently they still look tired and so what we want to do is try to get them more vibrant. And so putting more resources into that would really help out greatly. Uh, the Recreation Committee at the time, they uh, two years ago established the Adopt the Park program to really help assist because we did not have the staffing uh, to help us out and keep the parks as vibrant as possible. So we appreciate all those volunteers and all those nonprofit groups that have uh, assisted the city uh, during this time as well. We'll continue doing that, but on top of it, we wanna really spruce it up and help out as well. Streets. So. You guys have invested a tremendous millions of dollars into your streets, and uh, this is due to deferred maintenance over a long period of time. And so in order to protect your uh, investment millions of dollars into our newly uh, Cape Sild and overlay streets uh, to go ahead and take care of potholes and cracking as they come up immediately so that it stops further deterioration of the streets. This also includes uh, signs and street streetscapes such as uh, basically um, lights, so down on Main Street and down on Seymour as well, so it's all that maintenance as well. Uh, we also have to look at reflectivity on those signs as well, and that's something that the city hasn't done in a while, so we're gonna try to get onto that. The next item is uh, the city has more trails to maintain, so the city currently has the coastal trail uh, from Half and Bay State Beach uh, off of Kelly all the way to the Seymour Bridge as its responsibility, but there's also additional trail that the city needs to maintain, and that is uh, going south from Redondo all the way uh, to the southern city limits. There's intermittent areas as well that the city has to maintain. Drainage ditch maintenance, this is another one. Um, so the city received approval to um, go ahead and clean 11 of its uh, 13 ditches, and so city staff, it's all in-house, so it'd be city employees doing that uh, work, and we're looking at doing that in the spring. So that's an additional need, and we're going to have uh, all, you know, we're going to be at full power working on that. And then the other item is is that we haven't been, that we're really trying to work on, um, is on risk management grid inspections. So having a weekly or every two week drive-bys of geographic air, you know, take take the city in geographic areas and have those drive-bys and document anything that we see that are hazards or uh, risk to public safety and go ahead and report that and then make uh, the needed repairs so that um, we're saving public safety, I guess. So in conclusion, or what up, I missed the slide. So fiscal impact, can't miss that because it costs money to uh, hire an employee. So what we're looking at is, uh, 90, it's a $98,000 position with full benefits, um, and this, in, this includes the PERS. This is the all-in amount. Uh, what you have before you this evening is a budget amendment um, for the final six months of this fiscal year, which is about $49,000. And then we would uh, continue to, uh, on an annual basis, have that position included in the city's annual budget. 
So now in conclusion, uh, the additional maintenance staff will help the city reduce deferred maintenance, work to proactively maintain and protect infrastructure, improve the beauty of the city, reduce exposure to potential liability, and invest in resources to maintain current infrastructure and new facilities as they are completed. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alex, uh, for the detailed report. It looks like there's several areas. Council, questions, discussion? Councilmember Penrose? It, it seems to me that one additional person may not take care of the problem that we have. Um, and I would encourage us to be looking at it maybe before six months is up to see if maybe an additional person, an additional two people, could be hired. So just for clarification, so in addition to this one, you want another two? So three total? No, one more. Okay, got it. Wonderful. And then I'd be remiss uh, not to also, I think I was running through my presentation and I just want to quickly go back and uh, one of the items was weekend coverage. So right now with the Public Works Department, we do not have any weekend coverage. So no presence here on the weekends. And so what we would be looking at is uh, reorganizing and having that weekend coverage so that uh, any repairs, you know, because we get calls for uh, emergencies and repairs on the weekends. And so we don't have anyone on call, um, but we have Larry Carnahan, who's our public works superintendent, who will take emergency calls. Um, but if we have someone uh, on call, on duty on the weekends, uh, then we can go ahead and take care of those needed repairs immediately and uh, take care of any litter abatement. And one good example is uh, the issues that we're having at Poplar Beach. If we can have continued, uh, you know, have our maintenance workers out there uh, patrolling that area over the weekend, then we won't have as much of a mess on Monday morning and have those resident complaints. Thank you. Um, I think there's a lot of items you covered here and I think beautification has picked up the slack through the years of the chamber as well with, with tree trimming. And as you mentioned, I have some friends on Poplar that would call about the garbage down on the state beach there all the time. So I think it's, it's very well needed and we can look for, um, as Councilmember Penrose suggested, um, as we go through the budgeting process, if other staff is needed to bring us back up, because we did have quite a few people. And I think it's a really good investment, you know. How we maintain ourselves is a lot about us as a community and community pride. I think it's an economic investment. It has returns. People want to be here and use our facilities, so I'm in favor of it. I would like to say I do have um, a wish list item, and that would be for us to consider in the future um, some software that would allow um, interactivity with the public to be able to report things so that um, the guys and gals don't always have to be you know, circling around and looking for things, but the public, as they notice things are, are broken or there's a, a trash problem, you know, like Palo Alto I know has it, uh, people can report it you know, with GPS coordinates you know, on their phone and it goes right to City Hall and it becomes logged and then you know, maintenance staff can see it and you can even like send photos and things. So if we could utilize, you know, software and technology to enable the public to also, you know, play a role, that means, you know, less staff needed as well. But, you know, these are good high paying jobs. I think it's good for the community and, and good for the individuals. So I support it. Council Member Kowalczyk. So, uh, so there's an app for that, for sure. Um, there's a similar app for, uh, for graffiti reporting that, that that's available as well, and I think it's something worth looking into for future budgeting. I think it's a good idea. Um, so, just a, a comment about hiring, and uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the, uh, our, our, our current staff because they're, they do a great job with the resources available, and in the times when it was bleak, um, they're very loyal and hardworking and uh, very true to their community, and so we appreciate that. Um, and now that we are uh, in a more stable position, and, and I think it's uh, making a decision like this should always be needs based. Um, and you always have to balance needs with budget. Uh, but this is not a $98,000 decision. This is a million dollar decision um, because the, the financial impact of the city over the course of, 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 of the years of employment is approaching a million dollars. Um, and I think that's the way we need to look at this. And it's easy to get ahead of ourselves. Uh, and, and hire too quickly, and I'm not saying we are, because I think we're hiring appropriately, but 
I want to be cautious and, and to make sure that if we have needs over time for staff, I want to make sure that we provide the appropriate staff for our community. Um, but I want to be um, careful in, in, in bringing them on because of the, the lifetime commitment of those costs and the million dollar decision. But I absolutely would support this. I think it's much needed, particularly the uh, um, having the, the resources to provide uh, different coverage schedules, so weekend coverage and things like that, I think is very important. So I would definitely support this. Any comments? Because we do have a blue card. Oh. Uh, so, no, it's just, hurry up. Mine's very brief. Uh, I, um, I agree with council's discussion here. Uh, as uh, uh, Council Member Ruddick mentioned earlier in the evening about Main Street and uh, the beautification and you know, we've been fortunate enough to have beautification committee supporting those beautiful hanging baskets. And uh, uh, I know uh, all Bay Landscaping employee was out there at 5.30 in the morning during the dry periods out there watering those hanging baskets. It was beautiful. But I think to the gist of it all is uh, public works is really a resource of safety. And we've done a good job with saving uh, with our sheriff's uh, contract. And I think uh, part of this uh, employment situation could be, almost be looking at a safety thing with a tree falling down or something like that. So you could justify it without a doubt that way because safety is the number one thing. And uh, I know even mowing the mediums uh, for cars pulling out on the highway, staff is trying to keep up with that during the summer months. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a valuable investment and uh, I understand what Councilman Kowalczyk is saying regarding uh, you know, budget, we have these great ideas and we want to do it, but we still have to uh, uh, balance the budget and do the right thing. So I, I totally support this for a, a starter and then see where we are for a possible uh, additional uh, public works person. And, and we do have a card from Mr. Sulfur, if you would like to, to come to the podium. Jules Sofer, 536 Poplar Street. I, I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but this uh, topic is close to my heart, living on Poplar and seeing all of the senior housing going up at the end of Poplar down by Main Street brings to mind that these people, many of them in the housing that's already in place, are walking down Poplar to get to the beach. And I would encourage the council to start thinking about what those people are going to do when they get down to the beach at Poplar. The horses and the weather, the water, have made that descent from the bluff top at Poplar extremely difficult. I've seen young mothers who are rather agile carrying their kids down. and. Uh, it can be very slippery, especially this time of year. I think that uh, we do get monies from the horse stables who have been big on eroding that particular descent. And maybe we want to ask them for some uh, financial assistance in making it so that those seniors who do want to take a chance and go down there don't end up uh, suing the city uh, for uh, damages. Uh, I think I've said enough. <laughs> I, I just want to make it a nice, pleasant experience for all of these new seniors that we're going to be getting coming down Poplar and having access to the beach. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sofer. So can I have a um, motion on this item? And Councilmember Penrose? I'd like to move to accept it. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Aye. 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 Yes. 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 Thank you. We move now to item number 18. Thank you, Alex, for that report. We move to 18, which is appointments to Planning Commission and Recreation Commission Committee. So I'll, I'll do this up. Siobhan, yeah. Hello, again. 
The election in November 2014 of three council members necessitates that appointments be made this evening to the city's planning commission and recreation committee. The city's municipal code does require that appointments be made at the first regular council meeting after new council members are sworn in. Uh, staff advertised vacancies for both of these bodies on the city's website and in the Half Moon Bay Review for several weeks. And the deadline for individuals to express interest via the city's willing to serve form uh, was December 8th, 2014. Copies of all the willing to serve forms received were forwarded to city council for review and then a list of the names was also included in the city council packet. The process for nominating planning commissioners is outlined in the city's municipal code section 2.26.030 and that was also included in your agenda packet. The process for nominating members of the recreation committee is not clearly defined in the recreation committee bylaws but the city's practice in the past has been to handle the process in the same manner as the planning commission. Staff recommends that the city council make appointments to the planning commission and recreation committee. And answer any questions if you need. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we will begin with the Planning Commission and we'll start with Councilmember Pembroke. Have you made a selection for a Planning Commissioner? I have. I'd like to nominate John Evans. John Evans. All right. John Evans. Can we have a second? I'll second. Absolutely. Council, uh, Councilmember. Penrose has nominated John Evans for Planning Commission. It's been first and seconded. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. Aye. Congratulations, Mr. Evans. Pardon me, um, <coughs> Mayor Council Fraser. Oh, I'm sorry? I, I don't believe you actually need a second for the nomination since the council's just required to act on the on the council member's nomination. Okay, got that. Um, council member Reddick, your planning commission nomination. Yes, I'd like to nominate Rick Hernandez. Rick Hernandez has been nominated. We don't need a second. Um, can I have a roll call on that? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Congratulations, Mr. Hernandez. Well, as long as he doesn't wear orange shirts to all the meetings. <laughs> Go to Councilmember Kowalczyk for your planning co Yes, I'm, I'm going to nominate Les Demand. All right, Les Demand has been nominated. May we have roll call, please? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. And Les Man has been reaffirmed as a planning commissioner. Thank you and congratulations to all. We'll hop over to Park and Rec Commission now. And I'll go to Council Member Reddit this time. Your Park and Rec nomination. Yes, I'd like to nominate Brian Holt. Brian Holt has been nominated. Was he, is, is there an issue with that? Um, because it came in late? It's up to the pleasure of the council. Oh. So Council Member Reddick has nominated Brian Holt for a Park and Rec Commission. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Yes. 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 Congratulations, Brian. You are now a Park and Rec Commissioner. Is he here? Oh, okay. Excuse me. We'll go to Council Member Penrose and your nomination for Park and Rec. I'd like to nominate Shahrzad. I'm sorry, what's that mean? Shahrazad. Oh, Shahrazad. Um, Shahrazad Penrose. Oh, excuse me. Pantera. <laughs> um, throwing me off not doing a second. <laughs> Can we have roll call, please? Aye. Aye. Yep. Aye. 
Hi. All right, and the last appointment to. So I'm. So I'm not going to appoint anybody today because Sherazad was my appointee to for the last uh, uh, for the last five years to Parks and Rec Commission, and so she served with me for the last five years. So um, she was going to be my appointee tonight, and I'm not familiar with any of the other candidates, so I'm going to have to withhold tonight until I have a better uh, a better sense. So thank you. All right, we'll move that till next time. And so we have two new members, Brian Holt and Sharzad has been reaffirmed by new council member Penrose. Congratulations. If I could, Mayor Fraser, um, it's been a question that was raised previously with regard to the Planning Commission about when those, uh, or, or when the incumbents uh, actually vacate the office and it's generally been interpreted as meaning when uh, their replacement was appointed. I just wanted to be clear that given uh, that Ms. Pantera was reappointed, but by council member Penrose that there uh, is currently a vacancy on the Park and Rec Commission should there be a meeting between now and the date that an appointment is made. I don't think the council has to do anything. I just want to, I want to say that for the record so that, so that that's understood. Actually, I, um, I made a mistake. I will appoint somebody. I, I, I read this wrong. <laughs> Apologize. Um, so oh. I, I, I will um, move to appoint uh, Steve Bassage. Sorry, Steve, I read the list to you. All right, nominate Steve Bassage to Park and Rec Commission. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Yes. 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 Okay, we've got Park and Rec. Thank you for doing that. All right, we will move now to item number 19. And this is approved guiding principles for recycled water project between Sewer Authority, Mid Coast Side, Coast Side County Water District, and Montero Water and Sanitary District. Good evening, good evening again, Ms. Mayor and members of the council. Alex Kojikian, and I will be presenting uh, this item to you this evening. And this is the guiding principles for the recycled water project between SAM CCWD and uh, Montero Water and Sanitary District. So just to give you guys a bit of background, uh, the Sewer Authority Mid Coast site is comprised of three agencies. Uh, it's the city of Half Moon Bay. Uh, we're at 50.5% uh, ownership of the, of the facilities of SAM. Then you have uh, the Granada Sanitary District, which is approximately at 30%. And then you have the Montero Water and Sanitary District, uh, which is at another 20%. The Recycled Water Subcommittee um, has been, was established uh, months ago. And the city representative who, it was all three agencies who were on the subcommittee. The city representative was uh, council member uh, Alafano, who represented the city uh, during this process. And what they've come to conclude is uh, guiding principles, which are before you this evening. And the purpose of the guiding principles is to set out the basic terms and conditions uh, pursuant to which SAM, uh, Coast Side County Water District, and Montero Water Sanitary District will agree to uh, finance, design, construct, and operate phase one recycle water project. Uh, these guiding principles have already been approved by uh, the Montero Water and Sanitary District, as well as the Granada, Granada Community Services District. So proposed phase one, uh, the proposed phase one is consistent of two components and what it is is just getting recycled water uh, solely for uh, the OCP golf courses. So that's Ocean Colony Partners, uh, the golf course and for their lagoons out there. Um, and the two components are a recycled water treatment facility uh, located at the sand plant and the capacity of which shall be designed at a minimum to serve recycled water to those golf, to that golf courses. Uh, the recycled water transmission and distribution systems for CCWD service area, specifically for transmitting recycled water to OCP golf courses. And that would not, uh, the transmission of the water would have nothing to do with uh, the city of Half Moon Bay. We'd just be uh, given the, treating the water and uh, de delivering it to them at that point of where the transmission line is as part of this uh, agreement. So the financing, the parties intend to proceed with the design and construction of phase one with funds secured by the parties to self-fund phase one. So what they would be doing is looking at uh, to seek some grant funding, but possible financing structures and financial commitments 
and other things have yet to be determined uh, by the SAM board and the other interested parties at this time. So it still is this is kind of just setting out uh, the basic terms of what they're looking at, but uh, there'd be an agreement that would come at a later date um, to the SAM board. So in conclusion, I'm making it quick and easy. Uh, the guiding principles are merely a statement of the terms upon which the parties may be interested in pursuing further negotiations. An agreement outlining the final details of phase one uh, will be entered into prior to commencing the design and construction of phase one. The next steps are that these guiding principles would be sent uh, to CCWD for review. And with us this evening is uh, the Sewer Authority Mid Coast Sides General Manager, Rob Hopkins. He's in the audience this evening and he can answer um, any detailed questions about the guiding principles. So this concludes my presentation, and I or Rob will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Councilmember Kolchak. So um, just a, a comment that these are um, principles were agreed upon uh, across the member agencies at, uh, from the SAM board. So um, Hefflin Bay, El Granada, and Montero all concur with this direction as the guiding principles so that we can embark on a recycled water project. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge and give kudos to uh, former council member Alfano for uh, leading the charge and kind of breathing new life into the recycled water initiative. And um, very strange that, well, maybe not strange, but different from years past where we were driving that initiative and others perhaps had to come along, but we all got to the same page. We're all working together. Um, and so I think it's just important that there's a consensus. And so these same principles are going out to all the member agencies for adoption so by, by, our, by our governing boards. So I just want to comment on that, and I do support these. Thank you for coming this evening. Would you like to add anything, Rob? No, one thing I would uh, like to, as, as, um, even though our council, uh, Councilman uh, Alifano is not here, is to give him kudos for being a real champion of this project. He uh, really was a driving force uh, with uh, getting this off the ground, bringing the uh, uh, member agencies uh, together, and uh, getting a lot of the real base groundwork, the heavy lifting, uh, done. And uh, I just uh, and he was a tremendous help in guiding me into the beginning of that process as well. And so, uh, at this juncture, I just want to uh, give him a, a, a thank you from Sam for getting this pro uh, project uh, uh, off the ground. And thank you for being here. Council, any comments? Councilmember Penrose. Yes. Um, is there any thought about phase two? Uh, it, uh, phase two is, is uh, at least uh, to my understanding, it's almost just a hypothetical. We wanted to create the uh, 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 ability to do a phase two, but we would need to build, say, uh, if it was, say, Montero was wa wanting to take some recycled water, there would need to be transmission mains and all, there are a lot of infrastructure built. But we wanted to memorialize that uh, uh, Montero also has a stake in recycled water moving forward. And so the phase two is set out there. This, is not, this isn't just about phase one between Ocean Colony, CCW, and CCWD, that there is another major water player in the area who may have an interest in the future. And so that's why uh, it was very important to include them from the uh, uh, inception within this document. So that was the overall goal. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. Just uh, uh, again, uh, I, I think uh, we don't want to get lulled into uh, just because it's raining not to continue to pursue these types of things. Uh, um, next week I'll start in my 19th year on the regional board and I can tell you I've gone through this a lot of times. Everyone's going to build a plant and everyone backs out. So I, I want to start this concept for this phase here but it's time we don't back out because just because it's raining this week doesn't mean it's not going to rain. Or it, it, we could be in severe drought conditions continually here. So it's a great start. And also we just have, uh, uh, yesterday I spent two hours on a conference call regarding uh, the states putting together a little advisory uh, team on, on with regional boards for wetlands also and uh, diverting some water into the wet, potential wetland areas. So. You know, hopefully uh, uh, the customer base will be there to use it all, but if not, there might be another way to divert it into an area that needs some restoration, you know. So I think it's got great potential, but I don't want to get lulled to sleep. And hopefully our member agencies will uh, 
agree with us that this is the right direction for the future of uh, the Sewer Authority Midcoast. Thank you. And, and I'm pleased to hear that there's been some agreement between all the agencies. I think that's very important because Hacking Bay has a specific stake in this for recycled water because of our golf course. Um, if there's one true customer on the coast side, it is the golf course, and it's not a business that can be picked up and moved along someplace else. So um, I'm glad to see this is, this is a great start, and I hope it can keep a momentum. We do have a card here from uh, Mike Ferrer. Yes, Mayor, Council Members. I uh, just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, give a little kudo to uh, former Council Member David Gorn, who put Measure P on the ballot nine years ago in 1985. And Half Moon Bay voters voted, I believe, 84% to encourage the Council to do what they can to move forward with uh, recycled water. It's been nine years. I think there's a lesson to take from that, that we're, there's things not to repeat that caused us to have this nine-year gap between Measure P and where we are now. That hopefully that stuff's behind us, that we can move forward, that the agencies involved can just look at this as a good thing needed for the entire coast side. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, and item four, having to do with the California Environmental Quality Act. I'm a little concerned that um, it looks to me like we're talking about segmenting environmental review, which is precluded by, by CEQA. It's saying that each you know, entity can do CEQA on their own little you know, items that they're constructing and stuff like that. And it seems to me to really um, embody this, the spirit as well as the law of the California Environmental Quality Act, you probably want a, sort of a programmatic environmental document that looks at the system, but that's one thing. I do want to, I am going to, to vote on this item. I want to disclose that I have received a campaign contribution from Kenmark Real Estate Group, which owns the golf course, which will benefit from this. Um, that said, I've supported recycled water for, for a very long time. And I think we can't afford to wait any longer. Uh, the voters in California just passed um, Proposition 1, which is the water bond, which will um, allocate uh, a large amount of money for recycled water projects. Um, the last time we were presented with this opportunity with Proposition, I think it was 84, um, the various entities could not agree. Um, we, we actually lost a federal grant and we couldn't move forward with a state grant, so we don't want to make that mistake again. So I think that the timing is good on this and, and you know, we need to move quickly. And there's real, some really strong potential benefits for doing this, and that is reducing reliance on pumping near our streams and pot potentially having more in-stream water for, you know, steelhead maybe someday and have reconnect the creek to the, um, to the ocean. And, um, also uh, reduce reliance on Hetch Hetchy water for a golf course purposes, you know, very expensive potable water for, you know, watering golf courses. Um, I, I did think of one more question, that is, um, I know that um, the golf course uses the same water, I think, to irrigate both the golf courses and the, um, the homes in the area, and I just, wanted to ask a question about the quality of the, the recycled water and whether there's any reason for concern by the homeowners as to the, um, you know, the, the quality of the water being used for irrigation, recycled water. So I think Rob would be the perfect guy to answer that question on that one. What, what, what we would be assuring is, it would, one, as part of this agreement, is we'll uh, treat the water uh, such that it meets whatever quality standard is necessary for the golf course, and if that also includes the use of the uh, local homeowners, which would be an, an additional benefit, the use of the water, then we will, we will achieve that level of treatment. So it, that, that, that's, we're letting the end user kind of dictate the level of treatment quality that's needed to make the water useful to the, for, uh, the recycled water useful to the community. 
and I'm sure we'll have discussion in more detail in, in the future, but when we did try, um, and Bruce Russell's in the audience here, when we did try um, a pilot for recycled water, it did meet the quality of Title 22, I believe was the number, yet um, it was not water that could be put on the golf course. So it'll be, there'll have to be a lot more testing, and I don't want to go into all that detail now, but those are important things. Mm -hmm. To, to look at, and I'm sure you have your ear to the ground on any fundings due to your mm -hmm. um, professional responsibilities. Absolutely. So that would be very helpful. Any other questions or comments, Council? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve the guiding principles for a recycled water project between Sewer Authority Mid Coastside, Coastside County Water District, and Montero Water and Sanitary District. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. That concludes our regular items, except with the exception of number six, and Council Member Ruddick wanted to be excused for that one. Um, going back to six. We're just going to vote on that, right? There's no discussion. Anyone? And we'll wait to leave the room. We don't want to. She can just step out. Okay. Yeah. Don't run away. We want to wish you well. Um, I, I think um, I, again with uh, the work everyone's been doing to continue to move forward with this Pillar Theus Creek uh, uh, bridge down there. Uh, this. Hopefully, uh, we'll uh, uh, come through uh, with the Coastal Conservancy. I'm, I don't think we have a definite letter from it or anything yet. Is that correct? And just for the public's edification, I should say item number six is yeah. the acceptance oh, okay. of a $200,000 grant from the California Coastal Conservancy for design, environmental analysis, and permitting related to replacement of the Pillar Cedars Creek pedestrian bridge. We are working on an agreement with um, state parks that we hope to bring to the council in, in January. Great. So then I'm definitely, uh, as the mayor just read the motion, I think uh, it would be our recommendation then to uh, go ahead and accept uh, that staff report. Do you have a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Councilmember Aye. Councilmember Yes. Aye. Aye. And Council Member Ruddick has left the room. All right, so the motion passes and the agenda items we are completed for the evening. So thank you very much um, for those of you who stayed here, our new planning commissioners, park and rec commissioners. Thank you. And um, we will not be meeting again until January. There's no meeting on um, January 6th. So wish everyone a great holiday, a great new year and be safe out there in the rain this evening. Thank you, and we'll see you in 2015. Thank you.